Good evening. I'm Rob Himmelstein. I'm the president of the uh, MRJ, and we are proud to continue our webinar series. Um, first, I'd like to thank those who have our partners and co colleagues in getting this done. Uh, Rachel Roth, the COO of the American Conference of Cantors, Rob, Rabbi Harold Person, this uh, chief executive of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, Barbara Weinstein, the associate director of the RAC, and Rabbi Liz Hirsch, the executive director of the Women of Reform Judaism. Uh, we'd like to thank them all for what they have helped us do to accomplish tonight, and we really hope that you enjoy this webinar. Uh, Steve, do you want to take it over? Thank you, Rob. My name's Stephen Portnoy. I'm the executive director of Men of Reform Judaism. Men of Reform Judaism is that place where intellect, vision, matter, and spirit meet. It is this place because our members recognize their obligation to our Jewish heritage and values. I would also like to thank Steve Sherman, who is our Wizard of Oz. In other words, he is the man behind the curtain. You won't see him, but he is moving all our pictures around and sort of in control at this point. Our guest speaker this evening, Keith Stokes, was a guest speaker at our 100th anniversary conference in Providence just a few short months ago. And everybody there agreed his talk was worth the price of mission. He is knowledgeable, factual, entertaining, and also, as my friend Rob Stolzman would say, he is gifted with the rare ability to take a 300-piece page of legislation and break it into simple and concise, concise language even an elected official would understand. Keith is the principal author of the A Matter of Truth, a report documenting 400 years of racial discrimination in Rhode Island and the city of Providence, Municipal Reparations Final Report. He is the vice chair of the Toro Synagogue Foundation in Newport. And my pleasure now to turn this over to Keith Stokes, a man I am pleased to call a friend. Thank you, thank you, Stephen, and um, thank you, uh, Men of Reform Judaism, for having me, uh, hosting me yet again uh, for this program. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is is provide about 350 years of history in 35 minutes. So, forgive me if I rush through it, but I will certainly make this PowerPoint presentation available to Stephen. I'll also provide a bibliography and leave my email. So, if there's any uh, further questions, um, I'll try to respond to each and every question. Um, this particular presentation, what is called reparations, what it's about, uh, it's really about closing what we defined in Rhode Island as reparations, as closing the racial wealth gap. And one of the things that we did in embarking upon this, which is a bit unique compared to other cities and states and nations, is we really spent time really trying to understand the history of racialized discrimination. Um, I was asked several years ago by the city of Providence, the mayor, to partner with historical organizations and develop a very comprehensive history of racial discrimination. And that outcome was the Matter of Truth report, uh, which I authored. Uh, that report provides about, about four centuries of historical review backed by close to 700 primary secondary footnotes on the history of racialized discrimination, starting with the very European settlement of what is today New England, and then carried forward to 2020 to the George Floyd uh, tragedy and movement of that year. So again, I'm gonna walk you through the process. It has a Rhode Island flavor because again, we did it for Rhode Island. Our history is a bit different than other states. Um, so I'll provide a historical background and how we kind of approached reparations as a historical event. And then I'll talk about the work of our reparations commission and then the work of myself and others in taking the recommendation of that commission and operationalizing it 
into actual investment strategies and then try to answer any questions you might have. So let me begin with the summary of the matter of truth work. As I had said, uh, back in 2020, in the really the peak of the George Floyd uh, debate, uh, Mayor Alonzo of Providence at that time issued an executive order looking to develop a process which he called truth, reconcil reconciliation, and municipal reparations. Uh, the truth part was the development of an historical context of the history of racialized discrimination. And in that, we created the 300-page Matter of Truth report. Now, this report would not have taken place if we hadn't had active participation, as you can see here, from a number of state, local, and national archives and historical institutions. Um, this report was researched, developed, and ready for publication in a six-month process, which is lightning speed. And it wouldn't have happened without the work and support of our historical institutions. And <clears throat> just to give you kind of a highlight of the report, one of the things that we found on a consistent basis is, is that racial disparities, and particularly in economic well-being, can be traced to the very settlement of the United States. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we're able to uncover is, is that, and it's almost ironic as we're still managing ourselves through the great pandemic of COVID-19, but we also uncovered what became America's first documented pandemic. In between 1616 and 1619, this great pandemic, which was popularly called the Great Dying, would wipe out nearly every coastal indigenous tribe member from Maine to Cape Cod. So over a three-year period, before the Mayflower Settlement of 1620, before the settlements eventually of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Virginia, before that would happen, with that first contact of European explorers and settlers, the first contact that they had they arrived at a time in the early 17th century when they were bringing with them farm animals along with their rats, along with the fleas and pestilence of Europe. And as they arrived in the new world, they unwittingly brought with them significant disease. And these significant diseases from smallpox to measles to cholera would wipe out a large number of the waterfront indigenous native tribes, the Algonquin speaking people, that we recognize today. As these first Europeans arrived in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, they actually saw themselves and actually compared themselves to the Jews of the Old Testament. And in fact, they originally called New England English Israel. And this term English Israel was a Protestant Christian interpretation that God had guided them from religious persecution of the old world to now a new, new world, a new land where they could practice their religion freely, but also be able to cultivate and build upon and prosper for that land. So it's important to recognize that the very settlement of the Western Hemisphere, it could be Providence, Rhode Island, Charleston, South Carolina, Bridgetown, Barbados, Nassau, Bahamas, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, Havana, Cuba, the very settlement of the Western Hemisphere was tied to two very basic founding enterprises. The utilization of indigenous people land, largely free land, and then eventually the transfer of a close to 10 and a half million African men, women, and children to be the free labor force to work and cultivate that land. So the very settlement begins in New England with this sense of religious freedom, but it almost immediately carries into a focus on building wealth and prosperity. And it's important to recognize that because these two simultaneous actions, the use of indigenous land, and then the use of an African labor to work the land, free land and free labor would set the stage of the building of the Western hemisphere, the building of wealth, institutions, and most importantly, wealth that would be carried on for many generations, unless you are surviving an indigenous person or enslaved African. You didn't have the right to own land, to work the land that you've owned, and most importantly, to reap the economic benefits of equity that comes from cultivating the land or the businesses upon that land. So it's important to recognize that this very founding in settlement of the Western Hemisphere was very much tied to the utilization of indigenous people land and their subjugation, and then later the subjugation and utilization of enslaved Africans. And, and just to get a sense of how important this is, <clears throat> 
I think we all at one point learned erroneously that in 1492, Columbus would sail and land on the ocean blue and found a new world. But what we now know, and the reality of that is, is that Columbus mistakenly landed in what is today the Bahamas that would set the stage and open the door for massive European exploration and settlement and later colonization. But it's also important to recognize is that it's the African labor that drives and builds the wealth behind that colonization. And just to get a sense of things, between 1492 and about 1800, just under a 400 year period, give or take a few years, about 12 and a half million people left the old world and settled a new world. Out of that 12 and a half million people, 10 and a half are enslaved Africans. So from the very sheer number and scale, the human beings that left the continent, Africa, and traveled from old to new world had as much an African influence by the sheer number of Africans as compared to any other racial, ethnic, or nation of origin group. And that certainly played out in Providence, Rhode Island, like other early colonial cities in the state of Rhode Island, an early colonial state. And, and just to get a sense of how important this research work was, we were able to go back and actually document close to a thousand documented slaving voyages led by Rhode Island ships alone. In fact, Rhode Island was the most active slave trading port in British North America, British North America. We're far behind the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch, but for English, British colonization and slave trade participation, the center of that activity is Rhode Island. And in fact, my community of Newport was the leading community in that trade. Close to 74% of all slave trading ventures traveling from Newport to West Africa, where Africans would then be captured and transported along the Middle Passage to the West Indies, and then eventually raw goods and products, a lot of time harvested by enslaved Africans, such as sugar and molasses, is transported back to Newport, which is distilled into rum. In fact, in Newport, if I could take you back to that time, there were 24 rum distilleries on the Newport waterfront before the American Revolution. And what's important to recognize is that it's this rum trade that drives the transatlantic trade for Rhode Island and a large part of New England. So when we talk about slavery and transatlantic slave trade, it is not an antebellum South occurrence. It's not an American South occurrence. It's a New England occurrence. And in fact, the most active, prosperous slave trading ports in British North America before the American Revolution are Newport, Rhode Island, Bristol, Rhode Island, Boston, Massachusetts, Manchester, New Hampshire, Salem, Massachusetts, New London, Connecticut. These are very well entrenched New England towns who had their start and their economic prosperity based upon a trajectory of taking indigenous land and utilization of enslaved African labor. And the one event that changes that trajectory that very few people even talk about today, in fact, it's been interesting for me over the last few years as everyone's been embracing Juneteenth as an emancipation, when in fact, Juneteenth is actually a very regionalized Texas emancipation that was largely unknown and never celebrated in the American North and in New England. In fact, in New England, most African heritage communities would celebrate Emancipation Day on August 1st, which recognizes the first New England large-scale emancipations in the 18th century, and then the completion of the Haitian Revolution in 1804, and Haiti becoming the first Black Republic, free republic. And then in 1834, 30 years later, the British emancipation of the West Indies. So, Separate from what we think we know, the end of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Juneteenth in Texas, in fact, there were millions of African heritage men, women, and children who are already free and beginning to create lives for themselves as free people of African heritage well before the conclusion of the American Civil War. And in fact, as you can see in this slide, starting in 1776, over the next 12 to 12 and a half years, starting with the colony of Vermont and then all of the colonies, New England and the North, they would all emancipate or abolish slavery. So by the end of the 18th century, you have something in the North, in New England, that never existed before, large communities of free Africans. And again, 
They saw themselves not as African-American or BIPOC or color or Negro or any of that. They're Africans. And they begin to form their own institutions, African meeting houses, later to involve into African churches, African schools, African Prince Hall affiliate societies. They see themselves as Africans, free Africans in America. And they're now establishing very large settlements and communities across the North, spilling into the early 19th century. So as there are still 3 million African-Americans enslaved in the American South, whereas in the American North, free African heritage people were establishing large, vibrant communities in places like Newport, Boston, Providence, Philadelphia, the largest. There are almost 15,000 free people of African descent in Philadelphia by the beginning of the 19th century alone. So it's important to recognize that this first emancipation sets the stage of creating something that never existed, but also would set the stage for African heritage people to begin building lives for themselves. And in the case of the city of Providence, the east side of Providence, which is now occupied by Brown University, Rhode Island School of Design, it's one of the most elite communities of the country. It has a large concentration of colonial homes. The census tract that occupies much of the east side of Providence in, in 2019, the medium household income, medium household income was close to $180,000. So the east side of Providence today is a very well trendy and a very well established community. In the 17th and 18th into the early 19th century, it was largely a free African enclave. In fact, there were several African heritage neighborhoods with a sprinkling of poor whites and some indigenous people who had survived disease and famine and war would all co-locate and live in these small communities. One community was called Hardscrabble. The second community, kind of a derivative of the fact that most of the residents were of color, was called Snowtown. And what we find is, is that in the early 19th century in Providence, in 1824 in Hardscrabble, in 1831 in Snowtown, and then we see it played out in Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, New York City, any community that had large black settlements in the early 19th century faced the first wave of horrific racial riots. These racial riots were devastating in the case of Providence, both hard scrabble and snowdown communities were nearly completely dismantled and destroyed. Close to 45 African heritage homes that were owned were destroyed and burnt to the ground. What's important is, is that as a part of our research, we were able to not only reconstruct the neighborhood, we actually reconstructed, and you'll see a piece of it here, of the actual residents that lived in those communities, people of color. We have primary records of them as far as where they worked, where they worshiped, how they lived, and the taxes that they paid. But what's important to recognize is, is that these riots were deliberate. They were not happy. They were not a coincidence. They were not because of a disgruntled sailor having a fight with a disgruntled black man. These were organized and well advertised institutional events to remove black people from owning their property, owning their business, and living in their own communities. It's important that you recognize this because these simultaneous riots going on in each of the urban communities had three things in common. One, they were entirely communities of color that faced a riot. Two, most of the community infrastructure, homes, businesses, and places of worship were destroyed or significantly damaged. And three, each of those communities by the mid part of the 19th century would incorporate themselves as full cities, would form formal mayor, formal governments with council, and then those mayors and councils would begin to establish policies to specifically target people of African heritage and their families as troublesome and worrisome for the community. They also begin to establish formal police forces. In Providence, the formal police force is established and the police force is directed specifically to oversee the remaining African heritage communities and the African heritage people as potentially people who would disrupt and not contribute to the city of Providence. In fact, Providence would join other cities at that time 
in establishing a set of policies called warning out policies. A warning out policy is a law that is established to determine if you are a bona fide resident of a community or an outsider. If you're a bona fide resident, then you have the right to receive any of the services and benefits of living in that town. If you're deemed an outsider, you are asked by the police and you're escorted out of town. We were able to review close to 300 warning out policies with real life people, men, women, and children who were brought before the Providence Town Council or a subcommittee. And in many cases, it was determined that they were an outsider and they were warned out and forced to leave town. Close to 80% of the warning out hearings were largely women of color, of African indigenous heritage. So this combination of racial riots, formal warning out policies, newly established police departments who are now adhering to and overseeing the removal of largely people of color from their homes, from their neighborhoods, from towns in many cases that they were born to, is now a standard public practice and policy that is directed toward almost exclusively people of African and those surviving indigenous heritage. And it's important that we recognize this because this is before there's any other new major immigration wave. Irish are arriving and Germans are arriving in the 1830s and 40s. Other groups arrived later in the 19th century into the 20th century. But the first racial minority group that is being singled out for both public and private practices and policies to be discriminated against simply based upon the color of their skin are people of African heritage. And it's important to recognize that these riots, these warning out policies, these practices are going on in every major city in the antebellum era in America, both North and South. And, and I just wanna point out because we were able to pull out these records, um, digitize the records and represent them. And we're using the words of leaders of that time. This isn't Keith Stokes interpretation of Providence Rhode Island history. This is the very writings, the very words, the very statements by the mayors, the council members, the police chiefs, the business leaders, the civic leaders at that time, and how they saw the world, and particularly the world that was being occupied by people of color and being competitive with, with people of color. I also wanna point out that, and this becomes an extraordinarily complicated story, here in New England, particularly Southern New England, if you ever had a chance to go to a indigenous or a native powwow or a gathering, uh, the Wampanoags in Southeastern Massachusetts, the Cape, the Narragansett people here in Rhode Island, the Pequots and Mohegans in Connecticut, um, you'll notice that many of the indigenous people uh, look more like me than Plains Indians. And that goes back to the fact that those indigenous people that survived 17th century war and famine and disease, many of them were placed into either slavery or forced indentured servitude. So very early on in the settlement of New England, indigenous people are sharing the same spaces as enslaved African people. You actually find a large number of now widowed indigenous women ending up marrying or having common law relationships with African men. In fact, this becomes so persuasive that you end up seeing a significant number of surviving Narragansett people in Rhode Island, now with the larger white community of the 19th century suggesting, I don't quite think they're indigenous. They don't look indigenous to me. They don't seem to be indigenous. They tend to look more Negro to me. And in fact, Rhode Island in 1880, in the spring of that year, formed a committee to determine if any surviving indigenous Narragansett people should have a right to be a separate sovereign tribe in Rhode Island. They spent two weeks of hearings, interviewing hundreds of people. I was able to review those hearings. The hearings are led by, dominated by, and interpreted by an entirely white male group of legislators. And through that interpretation, they come back with a concept that the indigenous people in Rhode Island who call themselves indigenous or the Narragansett tribe are in fact not indigenous, but more Negro. And they came up with a very Southern utilization of a one drop rule. The one drop rule in Rhode Island in the late 19th century is if you have one drop of Negro blood and you claim indigenous ancestry, you cease being a native, you now become a Negro. 
the Rhode Island General Assembly voted to completely detribalize and take the remaining land of the indigenous people of Rhode Island simply by implementing a one drop rule in suggesting that they're more Negro than indigenous. This same one drop rule was active and was a powerful incentive in the American South to keep people of color from succeeding or participating in any socioeconomic benefits of a larger society. So it's important that people recognize this because when we think of racism and discrimination, we think of the exploitation of the indigenous people, we're thinking more the American South and more the American Midwest and the West and less places like Hartford, Connecticut, Providence, Rhode Island, Boston, Massachusetts, and Newport, Rhode Island. But in the 19th century, even though slavery has ended, there is still a significant racialized discrimination that's perpetrated on literally the only non-white minorities left in Rhode Island, African heritage people and indigenous people. And then when we look at the 20th century, and this, this becomes important because the work that we did didn't focus exclusively on slavery. I think many people who look at reparations tend to look at it through the lens of the American slave trade or American slavery. Who were the slave owners? Who were the enslaved? And our belief was is that indigenous land taking and the follow along discrimination and certainly African enslavement and the follow along discrimination started with slavery, but it simply continued and evolved well into the present day. And in fact, in the 20th century, we were able to document significantly racialized public policies at the federal, state, and municipal level that had devastating consequences of African heritage people and people of color. And it starts during the Great Depression with FDR and Congress putting forth a series of federal laws and policies to be able to literally either provide workforce training or job training so people could work their way out of the Depression or to give people what is today recognized is the fastest track of building equity in America. That's owning a home. Owning a home for many of us, for most of us, is the first major equity investment. For many of us, it's the only equity investment we have. And as a part of the National Housing Act of 1934, which would create the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, and other policies, the federal government actively engaged by providing a series of financial institute instruments to engage and allow working poor Americans the opportunity, the first opportunity to buy a home, own a home and build equity. And in fact, this initiative was so popular, it ended up moving tens of millions of Americans from tenement rental poverty living into home ownership in the 30s into the 40s into the World War II era. As a part of that process, the federal government made the determination that local communities, local rule will determine how mortgages are distributed, how homes are purchased, and where they would be purchased at. And in fact, what the federal government established was a mortgage insurance program where they would guarantee up to 90% of the value of the mortgage backed by the federal government, which was an incentive, a significant incentive for private lenders, private insurers, private builders and developers to begin building to a market they had never built before, working poor people in America. As a part of that process, local realtors, local finance institutions, and others conspired to determine who should receive the benefits of owning a home and what neighborhood should be a priority. They actually would create a process called redlining. Uh, very succinctly, redlining is simply a process that identifies certain neighborhoods that have high value and high return on investment and equity gain in those communities that have low value and low probability of equity gain. Communities that were redlined out were communities to be determined to be poor, disruptive, and most importantly, having little or no equity value. In the case of the city of Providence, we were able to digitize and present the redlining maps of 1935. And lo and behold, the communities that were redlined meaning that they would not receive mortgage insurance and private development and private financial investment were the communities which evolved from Hardscrabble and Snowtown 100 years before. Communities called Fox Point, 
South Providence, West Elmwood, Lippitt Hill, sections of College Hill. These communities had one thing in common. They were most entirely or majority people of African heritage and many limited income. And this redlining process would literally set the stage to exclude thousands and thousands of African heritage families with the basic ability to own a home, build equity, and create multigenerational wealth and passing on to the next generation. And this policy of redlining was going on across the country, and it was consistent in being applied to working poor and largely majority African heritage communities. And literally, it would be followed up after World War II with a new set of public policies through the federal government that would begin to revitalize these neighborhoods that were left in the wake of redlining in 19th century riots. And by the mid 20th century, starting in 1948 and moving forward into the 50s and 60s, you begin to see the federal government with the ending of World War II, the return of GIs, the GIs looking for a better life for themselves, looking to marry and have children, looking to own a home. The federal government issued a series of policies that would begin to clear slums and redevelop urban areas that were in need. Again, like redlining, like FHA and other federal policies, they would leave or enable local states and municipalities to establish their own redevelopment areas, their own redevelopment policies and procedures. In the case of Rhode Island, the Rhode Island General Assembly in 1950 created their own Slum Clearance Redevelopment Act. They empowered the city of Providence, the city of Newport, and the city of Pawtucket to establish their own redevelopment agencies. These redevelopment agencies had direct access to millions of dollars of federal funding passed through state um, budgets. They also had powers of what is called intimate domain, meaning they had the right to take private property as long as it was reverted to a public benefit. That public benefit was a very subjective decision on the part of redevelopment agencies. And what we found is, is that these redevelopment agencies sprouting out all across America were almost consistently designating largely majority African heritage limited income communities as blighted communities. And with the powers of redevelopment agencies, they had the power of taking people out of their home out of their business, out of their neighborhood, out of their place of worship. In some cases, places that they lived for generations, properties that they had owned. And in fact, just to give you one example, the Lippitt Hill neighborhood, which sits in the middle of College Hill, adjacent to Brown University in the east side, the Lippitt Hill community was one of the most dynamic and oldest majority African heritage communities dating back to the 18th century. In fact, the Lippitt Hill community was recognized as one of the most historic early black communities of America. The Lippitt Hill community would be completely deconstructed or what James Baldwin, the great author of the 20th century and literary critic who coined the phrase urban renewal really means to the larger African heritage community, Negro removal. In the case of Lippitt Hill, this is a GIS map of Lippitt Hill from 1952. To your left, you can see a main road to your bottom right is Hope High School, which still exists. And in the center, you'll see close to 400 multifamily homes. These are traditional New England tenement homes, three stories. People usually worked on the first floor, ran their business, and lived on the second and third floor, rented out in the second and third floor. Lippitt Hill was a traditional, densely compacted community dating back to the colonial era. After urban renewal policies and practices, Every single one of the families were removed and the entire community was wiped off to the face of the earth. Every single home, place of business, place of worship was deconstructed and taken down. What's important to recognize is that this was completed in 1962. Rhode Island would not pass a fair housing law until 1965. Any family that was dislocated in Lippitt Hill or any of the other neighborhoods under urban renewal had little or no chance to find safe, affordable, available rental or home ownership alternatives within the state of Rhode Island or the city of Providence. What we found in tracking many of them is they just left the market. They just left the state, they left the city. They were permanently displaced. And there are those today that feel that urban renewal policies were intentionalized 
to remove people to reclaim property for other uses that benefited the broader community and not to simply be limited income African heritage neighborhoods. And, and just to get a sense of the work that we did with this is we put together a list of all of the businesses that were actively operating at that time that were deconstructed and taken away forever. And as you can see here through this list of, of 50 odd businesses, it's everyone doing anything they need to do to live a life and build prosperity. So it's important to recognize that when we talk about reparations, reparative justice recognizes that it begins with African enslaved and indigenous land taking, but then it carries forward with a whole series of policies and practice that continue to this very day that consistently separate people of African heritage with the very basic opportunity, if not right, to build wealth and to keep wealth and pass it on to the next generation. Now, I, I just want to point out an important aspect of this, one of the real positive stories that came from this research. Irving J. Fain is a lifelong member of Temple Bethel in Providence. He and his family are some of the most well-known families of Rhode Island Providence. Um, they own several manufacturing companies. Irving Fain uh, in World War II was an officer. And at that time, he saw firsthand how officers of African heritage were treated, treated badly and discriminated against, regardless of the stripes they might have or the service that they might provide. And Irving Fain returned to Providence, Rhode Island, felt very strongly that we need to be better people. We need to invest in our community. Irving Fain led the coalition in 1965 to pass the state's fair housing law. Irving Fain privately in the early 1960s paid for dozens of black students from Rhode Island to travel south and to register people to vote. Irving J. Fain helped set up the Urban League of Rhode Island and help underwrite its first operating budget. And in 1962, Irving Fain came forward and said, you've taken down this entire black community. You've disrupted everything in this neighborhood. I would like to come forward with a development plan to redevelop this neighborhood. His plan was to redevelop the neighborhood and create one of the country's first mixed income and mixed race affordable housing rental projects and shopping centers in the country. Today, it's recognized as University Heights. Very few people recognize that it would not exist if it wasn't for the vision and the leadership of Irving J. Fain. So even though we're faced with challenges of racialized discrimination, there are individual men and women, not enough, but individual men and women who step forward and do the right thing and carry the message forward. So with all this data and all this history that we've collected, um, the next phase was forming a commission with the mayor and bringing together men and women of all walks of life and different backgrounds from attorneys to business leadership, affordable housing, medical, science, community leaders, child care operators, all with a common mission to design and develop what would a reparations investment policy look like in the city of Providence. The mayor and the city council to start the process set aside $10 million dollars of American Resource Recovery Dollars or OPER Dollars. And those dollars were to be seed dollars to leverage other public-private investments. And over a period of a six-month period of time, the Providence Municipal Reparations Commission reviewed the data, reviewed the history, looked at best practices around the country, around the world, and then worked very closely with my staff and team to develop an eligibility criteria and a program of investment. Our eligibility criteria for reparations investment is unique to Providence. It's unique to our history and heritage and the evolution of racialized discrimination. In doing that, one of the things that we recognize is that the people who should today in 2022, when we completed the report, should be recognized may not necessarily be a direct descendant of someone who was enslaved in Providence, Rhode Island in 1720 or 1790. So what we decided to do was to look at the people today in province of greatest need who have a historical tie to this history of racialized discrimination, either being tied by neighborhoods that were deconstructed or faced racial ethnic discrimination as they arrived later, but certainly arrived in many cases living in the same neighborhoods as indigenous and African heritage people before them. So the four criteria that we used for eligibility was 
being an indigenous person, uh, anyone who's tied socioculturally to the indigenous people that are recognized in Providence, Rhode Island, and New England. We also use the term African heritage, which I've been using consistently through the presentation. African heritage recognizes anyone that's ancestry originated from sub-Saharan Africa. Today in Providence, as an example, there are less than 5% African Americans in the population of Providence. There are more African born in Providence and in Rhode Island than African American. There are more Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latinos, Cape Verdeans, biracial, indigenous people of African descent. So we felt very strongly that if we're going to recognize people who have been discriminated against based on race and on a history of colonization, then the term is African heritage. You could be Haitian, Jamaican, Nigerian, but living in Providence today and facing discrimination, but having a legacy that goes back to your ancestors who had originated, were a part of that 10 and a half million that were enslaved and transported from old world to new world. We also wanted to focus on neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, what we call qualified census tracts. And we're following very carefully United States Department of Treasury guidelines for this. So a qualified census tract are neighborhoods that are largely low and moderate income. And just to give an example of, of a, how we were able to assess that, a few minutes before I talked about College Hill on the east side where Brown University is, and that census tract where in 2019, before COVID, the medium household income was about 179,000. If I could take you to an Onlyville neighborhood, which is one of our qualified census tracts in Providence, the Onlyville neighborhood in 2019, the medium family household income was 18,700. Let me say this again. The medium family household income in the Onlyville neighborhood of Providence in 2019 before COVID was 18,700. 98% of the residents are people of color. They have an 80% poverty rate. It was ground zero for the highest percentage of COVID infection rates and reinfection rates. And it also has a high percentage of newly arrived immigrants. In fact, Providence has the highest percentage of population that was born in another country than any city in New England, including Boston. Over 30% of the population of Providence represents those groups. So a qualified census tract is a Providence neighborhood that is facing significant poverty and significant social, economic, and health barriers and consequences. And then our final eligibility criteria is residents facing poverty. People who are either 50% of the area medium income or very, very low income, 30% of the area medium income, very poor people. So again, our concept was if you're a Brown University dean and you're making $150,000 a year and you're living on the east side and uh, your spouse or significant other is doing well and you have a combined family income of over $200,000 and you happen to be black, I don't think you should fit an eligibility criteria for reparations. If Ofer Winfrey moved to Providence tomorrow, I don't think she should qualify. Our qualifications were based not simply on race and the history of race, but the intersection of race and income equality. Fortunately or unfortunately, many people of African descent in Providence today, because of a legacy of discrimination, because of the lack of access to basic publicly sanctioned tools to own a home, own a business, build equity that was unheard of and unattainable. Today, many of these same families are living in poverty or struggling in poverty, which was only accelerated with the COVID-19 pandemic between 2020 to this present day. So our eligibility criteria is unique, but it's reflected to the documentation and the legacy and the history of Providence, Rhode Island. It's not Chicago, it's not New York, it's not California, it's Rhode Island. I will tell you, I was criticized personally by the black community with this. I mean, folks were telling me, Keith, why are you giving this to Haitians? Why are you giving this to Dominicans? It should be for black Americans and slavery. And my response is, the only difference between my ancestors and say someone from the Dominican Republic is we're an extra boat trip from Ghana or Senegal or Nigeria or the Congo but we're all a part of the African diaspora. And at some point, our ancestors were colonized and oppressed. Mine were the English, others could have been Spanish, French, Portuguese, or Dutch. 
But the bottom line is we all share today in 2023 this ancestry. And unfortunately, too many of us of color still share an economic inequality that dates back to this original legacy of racialized discrimination. And as a part of the process, and this was important to me because my, my training has been in business and economic development. I, I really wanted to bring an economist in to look at present day wealth inequality data sets in Providence. Because if we're suggesting that reparations and the greatest negative impact has been the lack of building wealth and that reparations is defined by closing a wealth equity gap, then we needed to know in the present day, in 2022, what are the significant wealth inequalities that we see in Providence that are tied to race? And, the, and our third party economist came in, she and her staff took the data, we're not influenced by the commission, the mayor, myself, my staff came back and said, these are the areas that we're finding in 2022, significant wealth inequality by race. We see it in home ownership, business ownership, education, income, incarceration rates, poverty, and health. And just an interesting example, Brown University last year did their own study. And in that study, they looked at home ownership rates of African heritage and Latino people in Rhode Island. Providence, Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island has the lowest black home ownership rate in the nation of any major city. So as we started to look very carefully at these data sets, we started to find, and we broke it down by neighborhoods, we broke it down by age, by access to um, resources. We were finding in a consistent basis that Providence, Rhode Island in 2022, at the present day, has a significant racial wealth equity gap within a significant percentage of the populations. And it is the Providence Municipal Reparations Commission that recommended as a measurable investment strategy that we would come up with investment strategies, programs, policies, legislative initiatives with specific purpose of closing the present day racial wealth and equity gap. And as a part of that, the commission came up with an 11 point plan I won't go into any of them in detail. I'll talk about one that's highlighted in red, equity building for African heritage indigenous communities. As a part of that plan, the recommendation was, was to create a land bank program so that the city of Providence through its redevelopment agency, one, to make amends, two, to use its resources to acquire vacant properties, underutilized properties, tax sale properties, to bring them and place them into a land bank program. And through that land bank program, making them available for future affordable housing or early stage business investment. What's exciting about this program is, is that is now being replicated at the state level and we're having discussions about doing something similar for businesses, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, disadvantaged businesses on a statewide basis. But what's most important here is, is each of these 11 point municipal reparation investment plans are tied into programs, services and policies that are in many cases already in place, have already met constitutional challenges, have already met federal review policies. We're simply targeting them strategically to neighborhoods, communities, and populations of greatest need, coupling racial inequality with income inequality. And the last slide, just to say, where are we at? What's the next step in doing this is? Um, the city of Providence has a new mayor, uh, the mayor has to decide if this is something he wants to embrace. Um, the community is pushing hard. The community would like to see the investment in these areas. Uh, we did move some of the city money into the United Way of New England, and they are now picking up some of these projects. Um, I'm working with our governor's office, our state development corporation and other investors. And we're looking at as a beta test, investing in and creating programs as in policies that are very much aligned with the reparation investment strategy of Providence. We may not call it reparations because speaking plainly and politically, that R word reparations get people out of joint. It gets a lot of emotionalism. And our job is not to have conflict. Our job is to put resources in the hands of the people and the families and the neighborhoods of greatest need and enable all Americans and all residents of Providence an equal opportunity of building wealth, holding on to wealth, and passing it on to the next generation. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. That's, again, a lot of information in about 40 minutes.
Um, but I'll certainly try to answer any questions you might have. I will provide both this PowerPoint and an extensive bibliography uh, for additional readings. I will close with later this month, the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society in partnership with the state and the state archives. We will be putting on an exhibit called The Manner of Truth, which will have over a hundred artifacts and items dating back to the 18th and 19th century on display at our state house, our Rhode Island state house, so that all citizens are able to come see this exhibit and see firsthand and experience firsthand how we were able to document and most importantly, able to bring to light this very complex chapter in Rhode Island history, but one that still impacts far too many Rhode Islanders of color. So we're very excited about this initiative. We tried to be open and honest. We know that there's significant emotionalism tied to this. Uh, the Rhode Island model may not be replicated elsewhere. There might be bits and pieces that can. I'm certainly being reached out by cities and states and countries all the time on this issue. Uh, all that I can do is provide a, a guidance on how to proceed and a pathway on how to document the research. But at the end of the day, it's going to require political will. It requires the political will so that we recognize that all Americans, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, nation of origin, sexual orientation, all Americans deserve a right to prosper in this country and within the communities that they choose to live and work and worship in. And we feel our reparations plan is one step in the direction of achieving that. So again, let me stop and I'll try to answer any questions you might have. And thank you for being patient with me. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for sort of uh, educating us. I want to start with a question that came up a number of times, and that's why should this issue or should this issue be of particular concern to the Jewish community? You know, I, I people have asked me that because of my close association with Turtle Synagogue here in Newport. I've, I've been on the board of the foundation for 25 years. Um, and my grandmother converted in 1903. So we've been Episcopalians in Newport since 1903. But before that, we were part of a long, old Sephardic family. And, and I actually provide a lot of educational programs on early Sephardic history and such. And I still own many prayer books and artifacts dating back to the 17th century in my own family. But one of the things that I recognize within the Jewish diaspora is, and this is something that I talked about in the very beginning, the African diaspora, how Africans were taken from the old world to the new world. If you go back and check and literally look at the African diaspora and when it began, it began officially in 1497. In 1492, Christopher Columbus was leaving Spain. And in fact, as Columbus was writing in his diary, he noticed that in the harbor, there were thousands of vessels of all shapes and sizes filled with largely Jews because of the Edict of Expulsion in the Alhambra Edict. So Christopher Columbus and his beginning of a search of a new world and the beginning of European colonization of the new world happens almost simultaneously with the Jewish diaspora to the new world as Jews and other non-Catholic Christians are being forcibly removed, in many cases in prison or put to death, starting in 1492 in Spain, 1497 in Portugal, the African diaspora is established by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel of Spain, the same two that adopt the Alhambra Edict, the same two that determine after defeating the Moors and their allies that Spain will now be a Catholic Christian country. In 1497, King Ferdinand officially edicts that enslaved Africans will be used to help colonize and to be enslaved labor of the settlement of the Western Hemisphere. So when you think in terms of the Jewish diaspora and the African diaspora, Jews are landing and living and worshiping in the same places that become major slave trading centers. That does not mean Jews are, are involved in trading. There's such a small population. In fact, I years ago, 
I put together a documentation of Jews in America involved in the transatlantic slave trade. And they're largely tied to my town of Newport. It's Newport in Charleston, South Carolina. But you're talking about a handful of merchants. Most of the Jews were poor, most were struggling, most were just trying to live their lives and worship freely. But the reality is, is that the earliest Jewish settlements of the Western Hemisphere, you think of Brazil, places like Recife and Curaçao, Barbados, Jamaica, Antigua, New Amsterdam, which later becomes New York, and even Newport. So for the Jewish community, as they arrived and as they were fighting for their own sovereignty, the belief in worship and freedom, they were doing this simultaneously within this very complex and horrific transatlantic slave and African slave system. I would also point out that the earliest abolitionists in the 19th century, you find a number of Jewish leaders now actively involved in the abolitionist community and working with their Christian counterparts. We have that here in Newport. Isaac Turrell interacting with Reverend Samuel Hopkins and Reverend Ezra Stiles. Rabbi Isaac Carrigal traveling to all of the early Jewish settlements of the New World and landing in Newport and debating the issue of slavery. And then later leaves for Barbados where he's buried, if his remains still exist. And then in the 20th century, with now newly arriving Jews, Eastern European Jews, Jews escaping the Russian programs, um, they arrive and they're facing discrimination. In fact, at that time, you have Christian Americans seeing Judaism as a race. I think some still do, and not as a worldwide religion. And you see significant, horrific discrimination. In fact, it is this next group of Jews in the 20th century who embrace civil rights and who are literally walking side by side with Martin Luther King, who are fighting and even dying to register people to vote. It is the Jewish community who is who is feeling firsthand with discrimination and not having access to a school of my choice, a place to live of my choice, sending my children to schools of my choice, employment, health care, all because of my Jewish religion. So the Jewish community in the 40s and 50s and 60s were side by side in fighting for civil rights and recognizing the needs of African heritage people at that time. So my, my sense is, is the Jewish religion as a community is very well aware, digging back to antiquity, of discrimination, horrific discrimination. And they have been allies and consistent allies in fighting for justice and fighting for what is right. Uh, and most importantly, fighting for people who cannot fight on their own. And for my sense is, I think it's absolutely essential that the Jewish community today recognize that history and legacy. Uh, and most importantly, recognize the fact that there are still far too many Americans. And, and again, I don't care if you're American that arrived yesterday, or in my case, my kids are 12th generation here in Newport. We're all Americans, equally. And I believe the Jewish community has been standouts in fighting for and achieving fairness and justice not only for themselves, but for anyone and everyone who's a fellow human being. Time for one more question. Could different reparations policies across the country, as opposed to singular, be applied equally to all Native Americans and African African Americans, and do you believe that would result in further discrimination? You know, it, it's interesting to me where I find so many people today talk about fairness and equality. And we saw this a month ago with the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action. And I had people call me, people I don't even know, but know who I am, and say, See, Keith, this is fair. We don't need affirmative action. We shouldn't base it on race or ethnicity or religion. We just base it on hard work. And my response to that one person who called to, to give me this kind of tongue lashing was, what were your parents doing during the World War II era? Because I know my dad uh, fought in combat overseas. 
Um, I have an uncle who is a Tuskegee Airman, a famous Tuskegee Airman, at age 20 was killed in service to his country. But I had my dad and three uncles serving, and fortunately my dad survived, my uncles came back. And this gentleman said, oh, he, he served in the Navy. And I said, did he ever receive a GI Bill benefit? And he goes, oh, absolutely. That's how he went back to school. I said, well, let me give you an interesting statistic. Between 1944, when the GI Bill was established by Congress, in 1955, a little over a 10-year period, close to 3 million Americans had access to buying a home. Less than 1% were Black. If you were a returning Black GI and you were looking for GI benefits to go back to school or to go to school, to learn a trade or an apprenticeship, to buy a home, to own a home, to buy a business, you didn't receive it. In fact, I was reading statistics that close to 60,000 New Yorkers in New Jersey families receive mortgage assistance through the GI Bill and home assistance. And less than 2,000 were Black and Hispanic that received a similar assistance. So the bottom line is, is that we talk about fairness as if things are always fair. But the reality is, is that if you're a person of African descent, of indigenous descent, when did you receive fairness? When did you receive a public benefit? If it wasn't for affirmative action and equal rights laws, which are still relatively new, the Board of Education decision in 1954 is not that long ago. My kids think it's a long ago. I don't. The Civil Rights Act of 1963, 1965, those are all during our generation. So we've had basically one to two generations to catch up and be fair versus 300 years of a head start of free land and free labor and free access to public benefits. So my point is, is that because of the fact that the first 300 years of our country's history, we were not fair, we were in fact, we had affirmative action programs, but you had to be white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant and Christian you had affirmative action programs. We called it mortgage insurance, small business loans, Levittown communities, healthcare, jobs. I mean, I can go on and on. So my point is, is that all we're trying to do today is level the playing field. There is far too many Americans that are living in poverty, that are not productive. And with the right strategic investment, we can help them get out of poverty, be contributing taxpayers, and being contributed members of society, which my general sense is, I think that's a goal we should all want to achieve. So I, I just get very cautious when people talk about fairness. If you're going to talk about fairness, look at it from the context of the history of this country and the history of racialized discrimination that was largely focused upon single groups of people. In fact, if I could take you back to the 1970 census of Rhode Island, 99% of the non-white people in Rhode Island were black. There are no Latinos. There are no Southeast Asians. They haven't arrived yet. Very few Africans. They're black. So if you were going to be discriminated against by race in Rhode Island in 1970, it was almost entirely people of African heritage. Thank you. I, I, I believe and I hope that we've learned a lot this evening. And I know that you're going to provide us with some historical documents and your research. And I just want to say that um, we'll get all that up on our website in, in a few days. And um, if anybody does have questions so that you don't get overwhelmed, I invite you to send them to me. It's um, the same email that was on your registration. So again, Keith, thank you. Appreciate it. And um, to be respectful of everybody's time, I think we're going to say good night at this point. Last word. Thank you, Stephen. And I will uh, send to you a video that we created at Turrell Synagogue called Pathway to Understanding. And, and please share it to uh, the participants. We created this video several years ago with the rise of anti-Semitism, but also to the fact that 
we were getting criticized at Turl for being an old Sephardic um, temple, having several of our members who participated in the slave trade. And we had some awful human beings out there suggesting that um, really tried to embarrass us and tried to embarrass the synagogue, our history, and the people who worship there. So we came up with this video to really provide people an understanding of this history that is complex. And I'll stop there. I'll send you the video. Take a look at it. It's been adopted by the state. Uh, we'll be bringing every Rhode Island middle school student at some point to Newport to visit Turo Synagogue so they can learn firsthand the history of religious and racial toleration and how our, how our ancestors struggled with it and how we're still struggling with it. And we see this as a learning experience so that we can give our kids, our youth, an opportunity to be better citizens, better than who we are, and have a better world than what we created. So I'll, I'll send you that link. Please look oh, at it. Please email me, and I'd love to get uh, critical responses on it. Absolutely. Again, thank you. Thank you all attending, um, and good night.